there are two kinds of cities. Cities designed before cars and cities designed after cars. With a very few exceptions, both kinds are overrun by cars today. City streets full of cars are never pretty or pleasant. The smaller number of cars in the narrow streets laid out before cars is balanced by the tiny sidewalks and cars streaking past your kneecaps. Oh, you're having trouble hearing me? Sorry, I'm already yelling. Ah, oh, that's better. As I was saying, a few streets in European city centers have been taken back by people. There is life after cars. Before we can make any real progress, though, you'll have to remind people just how awful it is to have cars in your face from dawn to dusk. Oh, and from dusk to dawn, too. The problems with cars are like fish and water. Who notices? But it's time to really look at the costs of cars. It's a long, sorry list. When cars first appeared, they seemed pretty innocent. After all, they occupied less space than horses, their emissions were mostly invisible, and you couldn't put your boot in them. Then the fascist Henry Ford, bet you didn't know that, started making cheap cars and soon a lot of 99 percenters could afford one. Cars soon choked city streets. The traffic problems were pretty obvious, but it was a while before anybody noticed just how poisonous the exhaust fumes were. Today, the automobile rules nearly every American city street. You need a guardian angel if you're on foot or riding your bike. Cars kill street life. We've known that for decades. On streets with heavy traffic, people don't even know their neighbors, much less have anything to do with them. Good public spaces are vital to all communities. Maybe that's why ours seem to be falling apart. Few people realize just how much space cars occupy. It's often more than half a city's land, and most of that is for parking. Cars need so much space that they push destinations farther apart, working against the very purpose of the car. Living next to a busy street was so unpleasant that people fled cities for cul-de-sac suburbs, spinning our cities into a decades-long death spiral. Cars are ugly. Say what you will about individual cars, once they gather in flocks, they're a plague. Cars are noisy. Noise is actually bad for your health. Since the invention of cars, more people have died on the roads than in wars. Believe it or not, air pollution from cars kills even more people than crashes. Car traffic keeps people from walking and cycling, which are actually good for your health. Care about climate change? Two words, don't drive. Cars waste oil. Guess what we're running out of? And guess who has most of what's left? Oh, and guess what we need to grow food? Worried yet? Getting oil out of the ground is expensive. It's messy, too. Cars are the most expensive way to get around, ever. No wonder you, your neighbors, your city, and your nation are broke. Just as with GM, nobody ever asked if we were willing to pay up. It wouldn't be so bad if we got something for our money. It's not just money, either. Ever enjoy a picnic next to a busy highway? No, didn't think so. Cars turn this into this. How many places can you walk to from home? From work? Now, be honest. How often do you actually do it? The 1% will tell you that people love to drive. Yeah, and sit in traffic half the morning. Of course, you could take the bus. Right. Hydrogen cars will solve all of these problems, as long as you still believe in the Tooth Fairy, or George Bush. But there's another way. We can just go back to cities the way they always were, for people to walk in. We add some good rail service, and suddenly cities are delightful places once again. So, what should you do in the meantime? First, put your car up on blocks. Next, pump up your bike tires and buy a transit pass. Then watch Car Free Cities, The Gritty Details, right here after the traffic and weather. <laughs>